The opinions of the commentator or commentators are solely those of the commentators and not of CJAD 800 or Bell Media. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 706 on CJAD 800. Welcome to today's Entrepreneur presented by Fuller Landau, a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business. My name is Dan Delmar along with Fuller Landau's Josh Miller. Hello, Josh. Hello. And this evening we'll have uh, Tommy Petrogianis of Silanus Technology on the program. He's our profile for the evening and that uh, Tommy will be uh, on the way. Uh, but first, as we usually do on a Monday night, let's uh, get through some of the entrepreneurial news of the week, shall we? Absolutely. Um, let's begin with, of course, uh, the big news in retail and that is the de de demise of Future Shop. Um, not, I think, terribly surprising, especially with the arrival of Best Buy. Same company. It seemed a bit redundant. A lot of uh, space being taken up by both of these retailers and with the shift uh, towards online buying. Um, were you surprised by this, John? Um, you know, th there's a lot of companies out there that do create different brands to not necessarily compete against the other, but it's certainly the marketplace calls. They have different different consumers, different different I guess, attitudes, buying attitudes. And, and so Future Shop and Best Buy, they were owned by the same people, but they were kind of, I think they were a little bit too close uh, in, in, in flavor. <clears throat> and that's where I think you, you got to this market saturation that was near impossible to maintain. I mean, you had Future Shop and Best Buy stores that were within a stone's throw away. Mm. And when you're essentially dealing with the same product, but one you know, is, is supposed to be you, you, the, the employees don't get commission, one the employees get commission, one you're supposed to get different knowledge base, but the consumer walks into an electronics store, they don't care what, what your employees are supposed to know, not know, you, they want to go, and the consumer wants to go in and say, "I want help," and they're they're under the assumption that anybody that's going to help them has the full breadth of knowledge that they're supposed to have in the department they're in. And I think they're the the future shop in Best Buy, and I think entrepreneurs have to take this lesson: is is really know what you're selling to your customer and make sure that they understand why they're walking into the store. So you're not such a fan of that in terms of a marketing angle, the fact that uh, you know one, one uh, store's employees were on commission and the others weren't? It's not so much the commission because as a consumer, I honestly don't care if they're in commission or not. I just want my answers. Hmm. So is somebody on commission going to work harder for for that sale? Do you feel that they're that they're going to maybe give you the right score, the straight story? You kind of have a little bit of question mark in your head. Where Best Buy, where they weren't supposed to be on commission, they're supposed to just give you their regular advice and whatever works works for them because they're not they're not really they don't have that same incentive plan. It shouldn't make a real difference for the consumer, but I wonder what they truly feel. Interesting story in the uh, Financial Post. Canada is uh, closing the gap on venture capital options. So we have, of course, a lot of venture capital in the States. Angel investors, as they're called, uh, willing to take a chance on st uh, upstart companies. And now we're seeing a lot of more of that in, ca in Canada with more influencers um, well, willing to... Uh, uh, to uh, to share the money a little bit and uh, and work on uh, interesting projects. Uh, do you see any um, any reason behind this resurgence of uh, of the venture Canadian capitalist? Uh, no, I, I think it's I think it's Canada following the U.S. as it normally does in pretty much anything and everything that's out there. Maybe with the exception of some technology that we'll talk about shortly. But uh, but other than that, it's the I'll give you an example, Dan. Asset based lending, asset based lending. Uh, you know where where essentially financiers lend specifically on receivables, specifically on inventory, and don't really care as much about the ratios as every as as your conventional banker. Asset-based lending that has been fairly strong in Canada for the last, call it 15 years, 10, 15 years, has been strong in the U.S. for the last 50 years. And it's really, we really got, we were really slow to the game, to the point that you have American guys coming in uh, and picking up that part of the market that really, if it's better understood by the Canadian lender or financier, then they can certainly pick it up. So as far as the gap is closing, I think it's, some of it is a bit of a risk appetite. You know, uh, your, your typical uh, Canadian banker or, or even individual, we're certainly a little bit more risk averse perhaps uh, than the U and then our U.S. counterparts, which, have, you know, have been known to have a bank on every other corner that really want to call it, take a little bit more of a chance to 
let's just say, fill their pockets. Mm. Um, we always talk about BlackBerry on the show as a couple of uh, loyal users. And some good news, bad news, of course. Revenue is increasing, just not fast enough. And uh, there is more good news in Canada than there is for BlackBerry in the States. Uh, do you think that perhaps this is the maybe the early sign of resurgence? Is is that typically how, how you think BlackBerry works, um, making something a hit in Canada then hopefully in the States later on? Uh, you know, it's it's an excellent question. And I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit bewildered by BlackBerry. Well, not bewildered. Listen, they... It took a huge fall. They they have this big hole that they have to dig out of. Uh, they didn't keep up with, with market trends. Uh, they came late to the party with what I still think is a great product. And Dan, we, we both Me use too. the same product. Fantastic phone. Um, and, and the operating system behind it seems to work pretty well for us. Yep. Uh, pretty secure. So uh, no, no complaints there. But is it a case of too little too late? And is it a t- is it a case of can they dig out of the hole that they that they created fast enough? They clearly have a good technology uh, from my layman's vantage point and from what I read. Uh, but the question is, how can they leverage it, and how can they get others on board and and kind of help them dig out of that hole? They're trying now. They're dealing with Samsung. They're dealing with other major players. Uh, the question is again, is it too little, too late? Or can they salvage something? I, I always believe that they can salvage something because I still think it's a great product and there's there's room out there for another player. But they, they have to do it smartly and they have to think not only the outside look, but also what's in that package. And uh, some news out of Tesla. They're, um, they made a big announcement and uh, it is not about a car, actually. Um, it's kind of interesting how, uh, how we're getting into... Uh, conversations about new forms of energy do, do you think that this this the announcement by the way expected to be about a um a battery that could potentially power a home or an office mm-hmm. uh so do you think uh new forms of energy are going to become interesting uh investment options in the next few years you know one, one of the topics that we're going to start with when we speak with tommy and solanus is being ahead of the curve knowing what's ahead in the next five years 10 years 20 years and trying to make the most of it today tesla i mean the the car that that he brought out is absolutely amazing. I mean, you you read consumer reports, you read any report on it, and I won't say it's flawless, but it's virtually flawless. Uh, you know, with the exception maybe range that some people have to plan ahead before they get in the car and drive down down to their favorite uh, place down south. But uh, but there there's no question that they are on the cutting edge of power supply and green energy or, or green savings or whatever you want to call it as far as the modern day equipment goes. And I think that's the trend that's going to continue. And they're leaving everybody in the dust on this. So, But somebody's got to pick up sooner or later. There's plenty of billions of dollars out there and these energy companies, they're going to catch up. They're going to catch up quick. So can he create that that first to market uh energy program or, or, or whatever product he's going, uh, all the power to him. I think he's done a great job so far with Tesla. I would love to drive one if I, uh, if I had it in me and, uh, and kind of, uh, I'm looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to the, and his whole Tesla pro- line, you know, he comes out with sedans, there's SUVs coming. I mean, he's, uh, Tesla's really going to take the market by storm. No, it's not, maybe not for the everyday person. That will actually be what, uh, what I'll be very curious about is if this energy to, to, you know, to power the home, mm-hmm. if it's going to be affordable. Well, they're, they're building a big uh, battery factory in Texas. So maybe, uh, maybe one day soon we'll have a uh, Tesla's that'll be able to take a drive down to Florida in, in one shot. You never know. Um, I'm a big fan of some old school marketing techniques and that's why I love this article from entrepreneur.com. Um, five reasons business cards still matter. And let me go through them quickly and get your thoughts. Uh, swapping contact information digitally is impersonal. Number one, uh, they are most effective, uh, the most effective direct marketing tool, number two. Uh, number three, a business card is the first impression of your brand. Uh, number four, creative business cards get shared uh, and uh, continuing to do the marketing work for you. And number five, business cards show that you are prepared. I, I love this list and I'm a big fan of, de- of putting effort and design and, and creativity into business cards. What do you think? I think it's a it's a great, listen, that you can never replace face-to-face business development and networking. Now, when you're face-to-face, you, st- you always want to present something. You're presenting yourself. You're presenting your words. You're you're maybe selling a little bit of air, wind, and steam unless you have a product sitting next to you. But handing out that business card and hopefully looking a little bit different certainly is something a little tangible when you're talking. And when you're, you know, 
the, and I and I think the, the the Chinese in this case have it very right. Whenever they hand over a business card, they hand over it with two hands because they they are humble in the presence they uh, of of the person they're talking with, and they want to treat and they take the business card with two hands because they want to treat it with respect. And without having something to hand over to them, it's it's you're just, you're continue to sell that air, wind, and steam. It's nice to have something tangible when you meet someone with an old. Absolutely. And people don't necessarily keep cards. I get cards all the time and I scan them and I and I create it. But you know, just to physically get it, uh it's just it it is an extension of the person in front of you. I've seen some some real crappy cards that are like, really? What were they thinking? But I've seen some magnificent cards that make me th- continue to remember the person that gave it to me and uh, that's where i think it has a place mine on purpose are are uh, not destructible you can't rip them just like you dan just like me you're indestructible <laughs> today's entrepreneur on cjd tommy petrogianis is our guest of solanus technology he'll join us in just a moment but first it's 716 cjad 800 traffic here's kira yeager for professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Inspiring stories from outstanding business people, Dan Delmar and Fuller Landau's Josh Miller with you on today's Entrepreneur. And this evening we have Tommy Petrogianis in from Solanus Technology. Tommy, welcome to CJD. Thank you, John. So let's uh, sign in to this conversation, if All you right. will, by uh, just explaining uh, maybe uh, quickly just what is uh, Solanus and what do you do for a living? Well, essentially Solanus makes paperless happen. So if you've ever signed a piece of paper, we keep that all digital. Uh, so whether you're a bank, an insurance company, a government agency, get off the paper and do it all online, all electronically. Now, when did this, how long ago was this? I mean, paperless today is a common term, but you started this many years ago, right? Yeah. My wife reminds me of that. Uh, so about two I'm decades sure ago, other things yeah, too. So about two decades ago, but uh, our vision back then was pretty simple. Um, back in the early 90s, the only reason you had t- paper was for two things. Either you printed something to read it because it was complex, or you printed something to sign it. And what we did was solve that last piece. Other people were solving the uh, reading a complex document. So iPads and displays and faster computers solved that. We took care of signing the documents so that you could stay all electronic through the process. So if anyone's bought insurance online in the U.S. in the last 10 years, chances are they've been using our technology to do it. So they stayed straight through without any paper in the process. Now, this is a technology that was pretty new at the time. It didn't exist as, as I think, as people heard from the promo, you were really ahead of the curve. So did it take a long time to develop the programming, the technology behind it? Uh, yeah, it actually took... Uh, Almost a decade to get it right, I would think. So we started, even though we started in the early 90s, we really hit our stride by the late 90s. Um, And actually what inspired us was this company out of the valley called GoCorp, who uh, today's iPad is about 50% of the vision of what that company had. They didn't survive, but they saw the tablet and the whole next generation of computing. uh, And we latched onto their vision. And we rode our sort of, we hitched our wagon to them and we developed and it took us a while to realize just how hard it is to get rid of paper because everything produces paper. Everyone can interact with paper. But if you look at a computer world, you have Microsoft Word for Word documents and you have Excel for spreadsheets and you have Adobe Acrobat. So displacing paper was actually technologically a big challenge. And it took us about seven to eight years to build a product set that actually enabled that to happen. Does that mean you had no revenues for seven to eight years? No, we had revenue. But back then, you know, you're talking earlier about the venture capital market and angels coming into Canada. Um, The truth is back then, there was no angel financing for software companies. So we did it the old fashioned way. You know, you latched on a client and you live to fight another day. It was pretty simple. There was no magic to it. Uh, So we bootstrapped ourselves back then. But by the late 90s, we started to get local angel investors who came in who are, some of them were my mentors. I learned a lot from those guys. And then the VC came in and as the markets exploded, everyone's been piling into the market. But uh, we had revenues, but it was a tough, I call them the lean years. The lean years. <laughs> so was there ever a time where you almost said it's not worth it anymore and you hang up and go find something else? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And But you know what? Back to if you believe that something's possible and you got enough people supporting, that's where a strong family network and a strong environment around you. Like one of my simple rules is be the dumbest guy at the table. And if you are, then you're in good company. So you had people who believed in the vision and you get the troughs. And like we've lived through almost uh, definitely two recessions, maybe three, depending how you count Mm -hmm. them. Uh, And we've lived through those times. And that really helped you drive the business forward with the people around you. Tommy Petrogenis. 
Tommy Petrogenis, there, my mic is there. Uh, Tommy Petrogenis of Solanus Technology with us this evening on today's Entrepreneur. Uh, more with Tommy in just a moment at 7:23. <laughs> For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Today's entrepreneur on CJAD 800, our guest this evening is Tommy Petrogianis of Solanus Technology. Uh, they make a sign-in software, I guess. Is that fair to say, Tommy? Fair enough. And, you know, when you're when you're first starting this out and you're really, you're developing, you're really starting from scratch. I mean, you're not doing it alone. Did you start with, you started with some partners? Yeah, sure. Um, there were two of us. And actually the name Solanus is an amalgamation of our three last names. So I'm the Nis in the Solanus. <laughs> and there's Michael Laurie and Joseph Sylvester. That's mm -hmm. how we create the name. Uh, but we... We were going after that pen-based market that this company out of the Valley was looking at, and we stumbled onto the e-signature market as an opportunity from a customer. Now, your first customer, tough to get a first customer? Oh, yeah. I think for anybody as an entrepreneur, that's, uh, that's the hardest thing. Get the first one, which sort of proves the vision, at least for the entrepreneur, uh, that says that, yes, yeah, someone actually believes it in what we see, because they're usually pretty leading edge, and they're way early adopters. Uh, so our first one was actually a Canadian customer. It was Ontario Hydro, and it was the Bruce Nuclear Division specifically. Uh, regulated industry, they were trying to sign off these big AutoCAD mm -hmm. drawing plots, and it would take them 12 weeks to go through the approval process, uh, even though it would take them only two to three days to make the modifications that needed to be approved. So we took that 12-week process down to about five days. And that was our first customer did it as consultants. And that's what actually launched the business was that opportunity. Now, you and your, your partners, you each brought something different to the table. Did you complement each other or was there overlap? There's always some overlap, but I think we all had our, our specific sort of strengths. Um, so some of us were more technical. Others were definitely more regimented in the details in terms of documentation and preparing and making sure you had a whole package. And then some of us were more marketing oriented and sales oriented. So we definitely complemented each other, but there was enough overlap that if one guy was out or one guy was sick, we can sort of cover for each other, but we all had our strengths. No question. You're still three partners today? No, we're two. Uh, one of the partners actually moved on about uh, 10 or 12 years ago. Okay. Early, two, earlier on. Earlier on, definitely. <laughs> and it was simply because the business was getting too big and it stopped being fun. Uh, mm -hmm. for him from that point of view, because it became more management than innovation, if mm -hmm, you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and the two of us still are, actually, I've been with my partner in business longer than I've been married, uh, which is pretty interesting. <laughs> which we, we, we won't <laughs> highlight and uh, and we won't comment further than that, especially since our family's listening, I'm sure. Um, so so let's come back to, you know, your first client, uh, marketing. How you, this is, this is brand new. You're ahead of the curve. It's there's, there's not much out there. Uh, you know, companies may get scared or they might not realize the efficiencies. They might not have the budgets. Um, how, how do you sell? How do you, how do you get this product known when you're first out there? When you're first out there, it's, it's a lot of personal, uh, perseverance and salesmanship, I guess, for lack of a better term. Uh, cause if you're early on in a market, people have to see the vision you see and there's no mass marketing tool or anything. And I still remember that first deal we did. It was in the parking lot of an olive garden, hmm. literally out of a trunk where we had taken a kid's etch-a-sketch kind of toy and said, this is what it could be as a mock-up. And that was enough to get the people to believe that we could deliver something, uh, which is kind of scary. It, it, <laughs> think it, about it, it. It is a little bit scary. How's yeah, your etch-a-sketch? It must be really good these days. It's a lot better now than it was back then. That's for sure. <laughs> Have you ever, you know, and, and I know we're, we're a long ways away from that first customer, uh, have you ever had to say, or have you ever felt you could say no to a customer? Actually, my my personal belief is that you should say no as often as you say yes, in the sense that if there's not a right fit and if you don't honestly believe that you're the right fit, uh, better say no than fake it. So we've had to, and I think it's a good practice, period. Now, you started off early. I don't know how much competition there was early on, but there's probably much more competition today, no doubt. Do you keep, how closely do you keep tabs on your competition? How closely do you monitor who's kind of getting ahead of who? Yeah, well, um, definitely we had competition back then. What's interesting is some of the early competitors that we had back then, some didn't survive, some did. Uh, some got swallowed up by bigger guys like Adobe or other folks or Citrix or some other folks along the way. Um, but now we've actually morphed to a place where we actually have dedicated people who look at competition from a marketing point of view, from a product point of view, um, from a sales point of view in terms of how they price, how they sell. And what's interesting is as the market's evolved, the actual competition you worry about has narrowed 
because you've only got, you know, a few guys that you compete with all the time, even mm-hmm. though the field of competitors is, has gotten larger, there's only a few that take up the upper tier, if you will, of serious players. It's the same names that keep coming back. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But after such a long period of time, I know that you're, you know, marketing is, plays a huge role in it. And it's, there's an evolution factor. And, you know, Dan, we've heard over, over many times the, the, the tactics of marketing in the first years of a company certainly change afterwards. And so there, 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 I'm sure is a rebranding that's, uh, that's coming soon with, uh, with Solanus that when we come back from the break, we'll, we'll tackle that in your future marketing efforts. Sure. Tommy Petrogenis of Solanus Technology with us this evening on Today's Entrepreneur. Later in the program, uh, do we talk taxes, Josh? We do. And- Sorry my my mic problem. We, <laughs> uh, we we do, and uh, you know there was a Quebec budget, so we'll we'll talk about the challenges uh, that entrepreneurs will face uh, with this upcoming budget, even though some of it's only hitting 2017. Excellent advice from Nick on the way. But first, it's 7:30. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 7.36 on Today's Entrepreneur. Welcome back. This is a program a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business. My name is Dan Delmar, along with Furlow Landau's Josh Miller, of course. And our guest this evening is Tommy Petrogianis of Solanus Technology. And uh, when it comes to technology, uh, certainly uh, marketing can be a, a challenge, Josh. Uh, well, let's start by, by Tommy. Uh, let maybe just uh, talk a bit about in general about um, maybe some some strategies or some uh, some ideas that you had early on uh, when developing Solanus. Um, what were some some angles that you wanted to communicate to your customers? Well, you know, it's interesting because things evolve really quickly. So what was relevant even five years ago really isn't relevant anymore. So early on, it was really about a very simple message, making paperless happen, getting it out there, getting the technology and magazines and the the editors in that space cognizant with it. Today, it's really about reach and spreading out the message through social media and making it even simpler to digest. Um, so as an example, you know, company name Solanus, we're changing it to eSign Live by mm. Solanus. Uh, we're rebranding ourselves down that path because no one can spell Solanus. Like we've been, <laughs> the, the number of misspellings, I can't even, you know, I won't even get on the radio and talk about what we've been uh, associated with. Uh, but eSign Live is a lot easier. So uh, if you start driving down to Cary and the Met, uh, right at the corner in a couple of months, you'll be seeing a big eSign Live sign. Uh, that's where our offices are located, just because it's easier for folks to to understand it and get with it. And it's a direct link to what you do versus exactly. Solanus that could exactly. be anything. You anything. Could, you Correct. could sell BlackBerry devices for all we know. Correct. Correct. Uh, so eSign Live. So so is that the drive behind the rebranding is so that it just becomes simpler for the consumer? Uh, simpler as the market's expanded, that, that's a big piece because we always focused on sort of the tier one organization, so the biggest banks, the biggest insurance companies. And as we're going to that mid-market and tier two and tier three market, uh, making it simple, making it easy for people to understand uh, really matters. And as the business has been growing, we've been almost doubling our bookings, our new bookings year over year for the last two years, and that's going to continue. And it's really about making the reach, simplifying the message, simplify it, simplify it, and even how people remember you. You know, you you can sometimes hear rebranding stories, a bit of horror stories, because it can go off in so many directions. How long did it take like what was the process from beginning to end till you determined hey this is you know eSign live by Solanus that's what we want to do this is the message we want to send uh, or update or revamp was that a very long process yeah it's it's longer than most people think it's even longer than i thought it would take um we're into our second year of doing it. Wow. Yeah. And we started it gently with our existing customers and the folks and the analyst firms and all that stuff. Uh, Cause you got to think about search engines and you got to think about how you've been found on the web and making that transition happen and covering all those bases. So it took a lot longer than I expected and we're not done yet. We're still transitioning. It's probably gonna take another year until we're actually there. As an entrepreneur, do you find it frustrating that something like this takes so long? <laughs> Uh, I, I won't say the word, but yes. So with an H, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but that's just the nature of the beast. Uh, and when, the, um, especially how things proliferate um, in today's world, in terms of how the networks and how search engines work, and how all the links work out there, it's you got to think through the strategy. You just can't do it overnight. As an entrepreneur, you want to do it tomorrow. Uh, the reality of doing it right actually takes some planning and project management, if you will. Now you we'll switch gears a little bit. You mentioned 
you know about growth you know uh, growth year over year you're kind of doubling the the the, uh, the customers that are coming in that must cause a real pressure on human resources and hiring and trying to find people uh, how, how do you deal with that i mean i presume you're always looking well a that's fun uh, let's start with that's fun you know sort of like any good meal deserves some spice mm-hmm. and that makes it spicy that, that those are good problems to have i guess for lack of a better term um but back to if you empower people to do what they do best and let them do it and not for, for us, what works is guiding principles. We sort of say, these are the big things that matter without hard and fast rules. So make sure the customer has the best experience ever. Mm -hmm. Make sure the employee has the best experience ever. Then do what's right based on that. You'll make a decision. Uh, it may be wrong, but it's for the right reasons. Uh, those kind of things really help streamline that entire experience for everybody. So when you're hiring, what do you? What are your kind of policies when you're hiring? What do you look for? Do you look for skill? Do you look for attitude? Do you look for more character fit than the knowledge? What do you look for? I guess if you sum it up, you recruit for skills, but you hire for attitude. So a lot of times we'll hire someone who has the right skill set, and within two or three months, they might actually be doing a different job than what we hired them for because they have the right drive, the right motivation, and they are actually prefer to do something else. Like if you look at... You know, I think I'm pretty representative of most people. Mm-hmm. I procrastinate about the things that I don't like doing. I'll push them off. I'll push them off. And I love doing the first things that I love to do first thing in the morning. Uh, and if you observe people's behavior during those first two or three months, you get a pretty good sense of what they love to do versus what they can do. And if you steer them as much as possible towards what they love to do, uh, it's just better for everybody. Are you, have you, you know, you've grown some, how many employees are you today? Uh, well, last year, this time we were about 90 some odd folks. We're on track to be about 150 now, uh, gearing up for that. Have you, you've had to get, I guess, a lot more formal in your processes. Is it harder, is it harder to be nimble? Is it harder to nip the bad ones in the bud or take the great ones that are blossoming and, and move on with them to a different, different level? Yeah, it's definitely a challenge, but I think it's, if, if you focus on the fundamentals of what drives people, um, it's a little bit more difficult, but it's not, uh, an insurmountable sort of challenge. That's for sure. Now, where again, I'll, I'll switch gears a little bit. You're in software, service, business, technology. Uh, you know, keeps changing exponentially. Certainly, from 20 years ago, where you are to, <laughs> to today, what what's been kind of the the major hurdle or the the biggest lesson learned with all these technology changes over the years? Um, the velocity has definitely changed. So, you know, if I roll back just even five years ago, we might be releasing a major product once a year in terms of an upgrade. Now we make a release every quarter. So every three months, you're coming out with stuff. So the discipline, I guess, of listening to the market, pulling your customers, getting feedback, and really prioritizing, that's been probably the hardest thing to do. But if you get the process down, you can still be creative. As long as you bucket as an entrepreneur, you got to say, we have to do something innovative every so often as part of that release cycle. When you're uh, when you're dealing with people's sensitive inf- information and up against competitors like Adobe or some of the big, more recognizable international brands, how, how do you convey the uh, the kind of trust uh, or security that, that you want to inspire in your clients? Um, that's where facts matter. I guess that's the best way to do it. Uh, being a smaller player, right, relative to Adobe or some of these big guys, uh, data doesn't lie. So as long as you can bring up the data. So we have the most secure sort of audits by third parties out there. We have some of the most security conscious organizations on the planet using our stuff. Uh, we definitely have the most defensible technology. Uh, we've de- our customers have defended millions of cases uh, and haven't had to go to court. And when they did go to court, they won. Uh, so that kind of data just gives you the shell, if you will, of armor that you need. Now you're dealing with, with customers that are really not a lot based in Canada. You're dealing with U.S., uh, really international businesses outside of Canada, you know, I, I guess a question that always crosses my mind when we deal with any entrepreneur that, that has their international business, business is, why Montreal? Why do you stay here? Other than the fact your family's here. Right. <laughs> but, but why Montreal? Well, let's start with, I'm, I'm a diehard Montrealer, born here, raised here, probably going to die here, right? This is my home. Um, and when we built the business here, it's actually a great place to develop stuff. We've got great universities. We have a very loyal uh, employee base. People don't move jobs or change jobs. They don't chase the job. They want to be in their environment that they like. And if the job's good, they'll stay there. So we have a very long retention policy. That's one thing. Um, and the truth is 
we sold a lot to the U.S. simply because they were ahead of the curve relative to the Canadians. Uh, up until two years ago, actually Canada, you know, our own home country, was an international territory being handled out of Chicago. We actually now have a person in Canada handling Canada, go figure. Mm -hmm. uh, so it took us a while. We had to be successful in the U.S. before Canada... Uh, became a viable market for us, if you will, but now it's taken off. So it's not that why there versus here. It's a great place to develop. It's a great, it's a great city period at Montreal. And uh, I love the place here. And you got great talent. You got an international vibe and flavor. You got a lot of very creative people who make this place home. And listen, I, I have to agree because I'm here as well, and I, I kind of love it, love it too. So thanks very much, certainly about Montreal, and I guess we'll move on to Quebec and their budget and and a little bit more politics and dollars and, and all that kind of stuff. Nick Moraitis, tax partner at Fuller Landa, will jo join us to discuss the Quebec budget, how it affects uh, your taxes. Uh, that's all on the way. It's uh, 745. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Welcome back. Inspiring stories from outstanding business people, Dan Delmar and Fuller Landau's Josh Miller with you on today's Entrepreneur and our guests this evening, Tommy Petrogianis of Solanus Technology. And we also bring in Nick Moraitis, tax partner at Fuller Landau, to talk about uh, the budget and how it affects you and your business. Nick, welcome back. Hi there. So you want to go through a, a few points, uh, Josh? What, what's one big highlight for you? Well, for for me, it's it's mostly about the timing of everything. So there's so basically everything is 2017. So it, it's what Nick is going to discuss is really the entrepreneur. You're planning ahead. You're kind of thinking ahead. Okay, well, how am I going to adjust or deal with certain business issues over the next? year and three quarters by the time all this stuff kicks in so well uh, i won't continue to take away the floor from nick he he works thank you he works the mic so well uh so we'll kind of let you in and, and give us from your vantage point nick the highlights from an entrepreneurial standpoint and uh and what what entrepreneurs should really keep in mind uh, I, I will as as you said josh a lot of these measures kick in in 2017 uh, although there's certain not refundable tax credits that Quebec is restoring, restoring, and that's going to be, and that started effective the budget speech, so that's the good side. But a lot of the other ones, and one one will discuss uh, uh, the Quebec general uh, corporate tax rate because this is business focused. Uh, it will eventually fall from the 11.9 percent that it is today, but starting in 2017, it will slowly be falling till it gets to 11.5 in 2020. So that's a long time from now. Um, and a small and, percentage. And it's a small percentage. You you may not net to get to see it, but it's at least an effort in the right direction. They're moving towards uh, equalizing with what we have in, in Ontario. Uh, the one that will affect uh, quite a few of the smaller businesses is uh, they're changing the small business deduction that you're allowed here in Quebec. Uh, Canadian-controlled businesses on the first half a million dollars of profit get a special tax rate, both on the federal and with Quebec. Quebec's tax rate is 8% and not the 11.9% that you, you pay once you get past the half a million dollars. Well, now Quebec is doing two things. One is refocusing on who can get that small business deduction. And they're basically looking to promote um, companies or businesses that have three full-time employees. Or no, it's a more than three full-time employees. They can get that lower rate. Or uh, businesses are in the primary or manufacturing sectors. Primary, anything to do with land, so farming, Agriculture, so farming, hunting, fishing, um, uh, mining, and oil and gas type of activities. So, so any really small business that is either one person or just a couple of people in it, even though you could be selling books or you're an active it, business, it could be a service. You are it not... could be a retail store. It could be professionals because there's been a, I guess there's been some press uh, written over the last years. A lot of a lot of professionals, lawyers, accountants, doctors who have been incorporating partially to use this advantage. Well, that advantage is now being removed if you're a sole, uh, basically the sole employee or maybe one of two. Um, so that's really encouraging the very small businesses. The very small business, ex except unless you are in, I guess, as I said, primary or manufacturing, then, that, then there's an opportunity to use a small business deduction. They're also enhancing the small business deduction for those sectors as well. So it's a very focus of who can use it. But it's, it caught a lot of people off guard, especially since in the last several years, a lot of people have been using the incorporation of professionals to, to A, to get the benefits. Uh, and to um, and do some tax planning that they have. Well, not so only that, going. and and I mean Montreal community is as we all know, and certainly maybe twenty years ago with you, uh, Tommy. But it's a it's a big startup community, and when you're starting up, you don't have uh, the big all absolutely. the employees to do it. You have a lot of people, so they're going to take they're gonna they're just 
killing another part of well, this? Well, right now uh, you're looking at a 3.9% loss between the 119 and the eight and a half million, assuming even making that mm-hmm. that much. Um, uh, and so that, that will impact uh, on, on the entire tax planning, which we got to go through and now start recalculating. Is it even worth getting incorporated? Uh, another one, however, on the con- uh, what that could benefit is all businesses uh, pay uh, a health services fund contribution based upon the payroll. Uh, so if you pay a million dollars, uh, you're going to be sending a check of 27000 to the Quebec government to contribute to the health services fund. Well, that too will start falling in 2017. Um, uh, to um, save you about 4500 if you're at the million dollar level. The bigger businesses who are at $5 million are paying 4.26%. They're going to stay where they are. So there's going to be a gradual reduction on that to s- slightly compensate because we we're we, we're one of the provinces with the highest rate of this type of payroll the tax that the many people will look at and consider it's a, it's a job a loser. However, if you only have a couple of full-time equivalents, you don't you don't get that, nor you don't get the, the small business yeah, deduction. Right. Yeah, well, so when we, and when we come back from the break, okay. we'll we'll hear a little bit more about some of the the positives, at least on the tax credits that do change as of today. Today's Entrepreneur on CJAD 800 with Nick Moretis. Some more with uh, Nick in a moment talking about the budget and how it applies to our taxes. And Tommy Peptogenis, uh, he has his one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur. That's on the way. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Remaining moments on today's Entrepreneur with Tommy Petrogenis of Solanus Technology and Nick Moretis, tax partner at Fuller Landau. Josh, talking about uh, the Quebec budget and how it impacts entrepreneurs and uh, certainly a few things for small entrepreneurs there that are great news. No, uh, not so much, but uh, listen, it's the Quebec budget, the Quebec government, and they're going to do things just in time for their for their next election. So maybe, Nick, you can. I, I know you said there were about five or six items. We only really a- attacked a, a few of them. So what else is there? There's another one which is uh, interesting. Again, starts in 2017, and I'm sort of curious as to whether or not the federal government will do something when it comes out with its budget. Um, on other times when I've been on the show, I've always talked about family succession and the, the planning you have to do to, to, uh, as a shareholder to bring in the family. Uh, there's one thing under a fe- federal law. Uh, a business owner can sell his business to a stranger, to a foreigner, um, and be able to use something called capital gains exemption. If that same business owner wanted to sell the business to a family member because they're taking over, mm-hmm. uh, he cannot use the capital gains exemption, or if it doesn't, it doesn't work very well at all. And it's actually pu- punitive, actually. Um, there's there's reasons for that. There's fear of abuse, etc. And I can continue and explain that. Uh, explain that. But you forewarn An- me, Josh. Another show. Not, yes, exactly. You turn off the mic. So um, what Quebec is now proposing, again, targeted for manufacturing industry and for the primary industry, which seems to be where they're focused on. That for, if, if businesses in those industries, and if there is a family succession, they will change the law to allow, say, dad or mom to sell shares to son or daughter who's taking over the business, and they are indeed taking over the business. Now, that takes you from uh, uh, combined... Now, the feds haven't changed this, so the feds are going to tax it the Mm -hmm. way they want to tax it. But now you're going from... You can't get zero uh, tax rate on the first 800,000. It's actually 813,000 now. You can't get zero because the feds won't go with it yet. But it takes the tax rate from a 40% tax rate between the two governments down to about an 18% tax rate because Quebec is basically going to say, we'll let you get it away tax-free if it's if you're selling it for business succession reasons. Now, there's a whole bunch of rules we haven't seen yet. So we don't know what uh, jumping up and down we have to do to get this exemption. But that's a very positive because it's been one of the biggest complaints of independent business vis-a-vis the government that we cannot cont- keep these businesses within the family. So that's a, a positive. Uh, I, did, I did mention there was a bunch of tax credits that were... Um, Cut back uh, in the June 2014 budget that have uh, come back. Um, uh, On-the-job uh, training for those who are hiring uh, students uh, to, to train, that, that's coming back. And for those who continuously do it, there's a new a, a premium uh, credit that you're getting if, you, if you've done it for three years and you meet certain minimums. Um, there's, there's, some, there's always criteria. There's, <laughs> there's always, but that's an interesting because uh, there's uh, quite a few companies who, uh, who do use this quite a bit. So, and I know there's probably there's plenty more that yeah. came in. So, Very specific. Uh, so, and, and it's it's really reading the budget, it's understanding it, and sometimes it's reading between the lines. Yeah. But of course, there's some things now and many things later on. So, as we come to our last uh, moment of uh, of the hour, we'll turn to our guest uh, Tommy and ask you what would be your one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur. Well, for the entrepreneur, I think it'll be some that was given on to me. 
uh, was passed on to me, which was there's a reason why the windshield's 20 times bigger than the rear view mirror. Like um, a lot of stuff happens. It's behind you. Really focus on where you're going and what you want to be doing. And that probably served me the best out of all the piece of advice that I got. I'm just really regurgitating them back because they were helpful for me. And I think that one resonated the most. If you're starting up, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to make stuff happen, it's what's in front of you, not what's behind you. And uh, Dan, you know, I, th I think that's that's one of the best pieces of advice we've heard in a long time. And, you know, as we said with the promo, they were ahead of the curve at the beginning. It's always that looking forward. You have to understand what's behind you and you can't ignore it. So you don't repeat the same the same mistakes, but you got to look ahead because if you don't keep your eye on that ball, things will definitely pass you. Tommy Petrogenis of Solanus Technology. Thanks for stopping by, Tommy. Thanks, guys. It's Thanks great. to Nick Moraitis as well at Full Orlando and Josh. We'll see you in two weeks from now. We're off uh, for Easter next week. The Exchange is next right here on C News Talk Radio, CJAD 800.